Welcome to a special edition of a new wave of entrepreneurship. I'm Scott Sturt, founder and CEO of Venture for Canada and your host. This week, we're switching things around. I've had the chance to sit down with the marvelous Marsha Drucker, host of the Crate Community Podcast and founder of Fuck Up Nights Toronto. In the wake of the pandemic, many of us found it hard to connect with one another virtually. So we sat down to talk about the importance of community, the founding story of Fuck Up Nights, and how Venture for Canada transitioned from being in-person to virtual. I'm excited to dive into this conversation about all things community. All right, so let's dive into this interview. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Um, so I'm Marsha Drucker for, for anybody that's that's new to my podcast. I'm the host of Create Community and the founder of Fuck Up Nights Toronto. On this podcast, we discuss all things community. I get to speak with folks who are community builders and dive into what community truly means and how it evolves with these changing times. Today, I am pleased to be joined by Scott Stewart, co-founder and CEO of Venture for Canada, a nonprofit organization on the mission to foster the entrepreneurial skills and mindsets of young Canadians. Venture for Canada's vision is a Canada where young people can equitably realize their entrepreneurial potential to build the most prosperous place in the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Scott. How are you today? I am doing uh, great. Uh, it uh, was a fun Halloween weekend and uh, excited to, to get back to it uh, the, this week. So thanks so much for coming, uh, having me on the, the podcast today. That's awesome. Did you dress up as anything for Halloween? Uh, I just had like a Halloween sweater. Uh, I did. Ex- <laughs> in, uh, it was my cat's first uh, Halloween. So <gasps> the, she, the kitten got dressed up a little bit. She had uh, a little Halloween hat and then she had some Halloween uh, bat uh, uh, kind of wings that she wore. So it was quite cute getting her dressed up, although I don't think she liked it as much as me. That is so cute. I would love to see a picture of that. So today we're going to chat about um, all things um, online communities and, and how we can create thriving communities online. And I'm so excited to dig into how you're doing this at VFC. So can you tell me a little bit about how VFC shifted from a thriving in-person community to having to adapt to becoming virtually focused? So it was definitely a big transition uh, at first. Uh, in particular, w- for our fellowship program, we deliver a close to month long in-person training camp that we usually host in, in Kingston, Ontario. And that y- takes place uh, kind of from the middle of May to the middle of June each year. And obviously the pandemic hit in March 2020. So very quickly, we had to pivot our entire training camp to taking place uh, virtually. But in terms of kind of how uh, we, we made the transition, uh, I'd say it's definitely kind of evolved uh, a little bit uh, over time. Some of the the challenges I think that Venture for Canada uh, faced was delivering something virtually and fostering community virtually is just so challenging. And I think uh, one of the the lessons learned from the pandemic is the importance of just face-to-face gatherings. Uh, I really do think it is impossible to foster community as effectively be a virtual uh, setting as you can uh, kind of in person. So in terms of kind of challenges, that's one of the, the most is just we build more trust with people, I think, when we meet them in person and we can see people's body movements and their their faces and, and how they, they reacted to different things. And that in and itself presents a huge challenge, I think, in moving uh, things to, to, a, to a virtual, particularly in the context that our, our fellow training camp is, it's about learning, but a huge part of it is about fostering this whole community of Venture for Canada fellows who build friendships and, and really form these relationships that are intended to last for, for a long period of time. So in terms of kind of how we actually tried to overcome uh, this uh, this sort of transition to virtual, it was through a few different ways. I think one is really embracing kind of asynchronous uh, learning. So giving people, not, not just having it so that people are just sitting in Zoom rooms, listening to somebody speak for like eight hours a day for four or four weeks. I think that was one of the things that we realized is like that's not an engaging and that does not foster a sense of community. So for our most recent fellow training camp in 2021, which was also virtual, one of the things we would do is virtual uh, homerooms where uh, different uh, Venture for Canada fellows were kind of broken up into uh, different groups of, uh, I think, around 10 different homerooms. And they were able to foster community in kind of smaller uh, group settings. We also tried to match uh, Venture for Canada fellows kind of one-on-one to have different kind of coffee chats with each other throughout the duration of, of training camp. 
uh, and uh, also just doing a lot of like fun activities like pet parade uh, on Slack, uh, where <laughs> fellows share different pictures of their pets, and and uh, is a good way to kind of break down some of the barriers uh, virtually. So I just kept zero, zeroing in on on training camp, but I, I really think that those. Uh, one of the things that's really important, particularly if you're running a, a training program or any kind of program that involves like 100 people or, or you know, more than like 30, 40 people, is how can you break those groups into smaller kind of cohorts uh, yeah. so that they can really build uh, bonds with, with one another? Yeah, that's, that all sounds amazing. Um, what have been some of your biggest lessons learned from, from running these types of programs? Like, has there, has there been clear things that have worked and, and, has, and haven't worked? Uh, yeah, I'd say one of the things that uh, one of the things that I think has been important uh, for us is looking at making sure that there's Zoom fatigue is like a real thing, yeah. and making sure that you're not running programming that's taking place for like people are aren't on Zoom for ten hours because that's just not an enjoyable experience I think for for anybody, uh, and uh, so I think that that's one is is while. Well, before the pandemic, we would deliver things that would, we would deliver training uh, camp, which would be eight to 10 hours in person a day in Kingston. Uh, you can't do an eight to 10 hours of programming uh, virtually via Zoom. So really kind of looking at how do you shorten things up? How do you still try to transmit a similar amount of content, but in, in a far uh, less uh, kind of uh, period of time? So I think that, that that's one thing that that, that worked was, was shortening it and, and uh, also trying to build in potentially homework in so that people, some of the learnings are, are, are uh, given to people by kind of reading uh, in, in advance. Uh, I'd also say that uh, one of the things that, that also uh, kind of worked uh, well uh, in terms of kind of a specific uh, tactic was uh, looking at kind of the adoption of uh, Slack uh, and we, we use it internally, but I think it was a great way to kind of facilitate uh, interpersonal kind of dialogue between a lot of the, the Venture for Canada uh, fellows. Uh, and I'd say lastly, uh, another thing that we, we looked at is really trying to give people choices. So we, uh, we implemented kind of a point system where um, uh, Venture for Canada fellows could, would get basically um, be able to choose more what are the different kinds of training activities that, that they could, could uh, uh, attend. So not necessarily having everybody attend every single session, uh, but giving people more agency. And I think the great thing about doing it virtually is it gave us a lot more flexibility to run uh, uh, different kinds of learning or educational sessions concurrently, which ultimately kind of give people more choice. So those are there's a lot of different lessons, but I'd say those are some of the the main ones. That's that's really interesting. I think you know like something that you touched on, and uh, I found that a lot of my guests have have kind of had a similar lesson in that you know if you try to recreate exactly what you did. Um, pre-COVID or, you know, in person in a, in a virtual format, it, it usually doesn't work. Like it, it doesn't translate the same way, but there's so many unique opportunities online to create accessibility with your events, to, to involve more people, to create more connections. Um, so really, really cool that, that you've been able to, to learn from, from all of those different programs and to, to really take them to the next level. Um, with Slack, I'm, I'm curious, how are you sort of like facilitating those introductions for people and, and what's, how do you kind of keep the conversation going between um, events and programs that you're running? Uh, I think there are a few different ways. One is really uh, kind of encouraging certain people to regularly post and having staff people regularly uh, post to keep the channels alive. I think that when you see nobody post on a channel for a long time, the channel sort of starts to die just from lack of use. Uh, so one is creating those kind of norms where people are actually, uh, all the channels are regularly kind of having some kind of uh, posts. I think two is communicating uh, major kind of details or updates for the fellows via Slack on an ongoing basis. So the Venture for Canada fellows attend a training camp for a month, but then they, they're still in the program for a year after the, the training camp. So a lot of the ways we'll try to communicate with fellows is actually through our Slack portal. Um, and ultimately, if you're sharing kind of mission critical or really important information via Slack, it's an incentive for people to actually engage and use the platform. That's very cool. You should also, you should check out Donut. Actually, the last interview that I did on the podcast was the founder of Donut. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, a, it's an app that integrates with Slack and it creates introductions and icebreaker topics for folks within your community. It's free to use and it's like, it's so awesome. I use it at work and, and then part of other communities that that I participate in Slack. Yeah, I've heard Donut is great, and I think we might have used it in the past. And it's a great way to kind of create those serendipitous 
encounters between different people. Uh, for our listeners, like in essence, Donut will, uh, it gives people, it randomly will match two different people together to have a coffee chat. Uh, so if you have like 100 people who might not know, necessarily know each other, if you have 1,000 people who don't know each other, it's a fantastic tool to, to facilitate those kind of serendipitous uh, social connections, which would potentially happen at like an in-person conference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So speaking of those serendipitous connections or, you know, like really the magic of, of a community and bringing people together, are there any stories that kind of jump to mind, maybe of fellows that have met each other and built businesses together or just any other really great connections that have happened online or, or through past programs that you've done in person? Absolutely. So we've actually had a few different, well, we've had two different sets of Venture for Canada fellows that have now gotten married uh, to each other through Venture for Canada. <gasps> and uh, the first cohort only graduated four years ago, and we've actually had two Venture for Canada weddings already, which is pretty impressive in a, in a short period of time. And uh, there's several other fellows that are in like long-term relationships with one another <laughs> through VFC. So <laughs> I, I love that. that. That's a great example of, uh, I think, social impact uh, of the organization. Uh, in terms of some other alumni that have done great things is Charlie Fang is, is a uh, Venture for Canada fellow from our 2016 cohort and the co-founder of uh, Clearco. Uh, and he uh, played, uh, he worked with a couple of different Venture for Canada fellows at a really early stage. So at one point, Clearco had only 15 to 20 employees and like a quarter of them were Venture for Canada uh, fellows. Wow. Um, now, obviously, Clearco is like, couple hundred employees, they've raised like hundreds of millions of dollars, much bigger. Uh, but I think that that was a great example of Venture for Canada fellows like working together in a company in an early stage. Uh, Chris Grouchy is a Venture for Canada fellow also from the 2016 cohort who he's launched a company called Convictional where they just announced that they raised like a $7 million Series A. Uh, and there's some Venture for Canada fellows who work as part of his uh, team. Uh, and I think that that's also a great example of a kind of an entrepreneurial Venture for Canada success story. That's so incredible. That's and I actually have a similar story with Fuck Up Nights. We all, there's also a couple that met at one of the events. I don't know if they're married yet. Maybe that would be amazing. But that was so heartwarming to see and to hear that they met at one of the events and they would go to future events together. It was really really cute. It is. Um, it is pretty remarkable. Like it's cool when you think, oh, if I didn't do this or if I hadn't, you know, if you you hadn't hosted that event, they would never have have met. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it, it's fantastic. There's I, on a really macro scale, uh, there's one person I recently interviewed uh, from uh, who's the founder of a dating app called Snack App. That's now yeah. <laughs> one of the top ten most downloaded dating apps in the U.S. It's like TikTok for dating. And I was saying that she she was an executive at Plenty of Fish for a long time. And I was saying it must be something really fulfilling when you like launch an online dating company when you have the potential to like facilitate millions of romantic like matches, like long term relationships yeah. that really transform people's lives. But it's interesting. The same thing when you found a company, when you launch something new, uh, you well, I'd say one of the ancillary benefits is just that you're facilitating interpersonal connections which potentially result in marriages and, and actually sort of transform the trajectory of people's lives, which is kind of cool to think about. Yeah, it's it's absolutely wild to think about, and that's that's one of my favorite parts of running a community. Um, we've we've also had a ton of stories of you know people starting businesses together or finding new jobs, ironically through a community called Fuck Up Nights. Um, that's really great. Um, I'm curious, kind of selfishly, do you highlight these stories to your community in any way? I I don't know if I really like I don't really have like a process for highlighting them at Fuck Up Nights, but I really want to start because I it's it's so incredible and so magical that these connections happen. We have a Venture for Canada uh, fellow newsletter where I think we announced, uh, we shared kind of congrats when fellows have gotten married to each other. So we haven't done like anything like a blog post or anything, but kind of internally we, we do celebrate it, which I think is, is, a, is a nice uh, touch. Yeah, that could be so fun or even like a showcase of, of the businesses that have started or like with Fuck Up Nights, I'm thinking of doing something with them, um, with bringing some past speakers back and uh, like if they had another failure to share, um, calling it something like repeat offenders. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's so many fun ways to kind of um, bring folks back from the community and, and highlight them. Really curious, like what inspired you to actually start VFC and then what was that journey like? Like how did you take it from idea to, to actually bringing it to life? So the initial genesis of Venture for Canada is I was living in the United States and I saw an organization called Venture for America. And uh, I was an undergrad, I attended Georgetown uh, University in Washington, DC. 
And I saw this Venture for America program where they recruit, train, and support recent grads of American universities to go work at startups across the United States and thought, oh, I would love to apply to a program like this. Uh, I couldn't because I'm not a US citizen. Uh, and I went to go work at Goldman Sachs after graduation. And all the while, while I was at Goldman Sachs, I was thinking to myself, why not launch something like a, a venture for Canada? Like, why doesn't this exist? So I incorporated Venture for Canada in Canada. Uh, I began working on it on the side while I was at Goldman Sachs. And then I launched Venture for Canada in essence to try to create an organization that I would have liked uh, because uh, I saw that it was a challenge for recent grads and young people to get employment opportunities at startups and small businesses. And flash forward eight years, we've evolved a lot as an organization. And I, our focus now is more about how do you, we better prepare young people to have the essential entrepreneurial skills, which is the ability to identify and act upon opportunities to create impact for others that people need to, to, to have fulfilling fear, uh, careers in the 21st uh, century. And uh, that, so I, in many ways, we've evolved from this kind of taking a model that I liked in, in the US and bring it to Canada to a much broader model, which is around fostering entrepreneurial skills through work integrated learning programs where we support young people uh, to go work at startups and small businesses uh, across the country. Very cool. And what's next for VFC? What, like, how can people get involved and what should we watch out for? So we've diversified, we continue to diversify our programs. We have a program, uh, one program that we have is a entrepreneurship program that we just launched in August, where we support young Canadian, uh, young post-secondary students across the country to do short project-based uh, uh, learning opportunities at startups and small businesses across the country. Uh, the projects last for seven weeks. Uh, there's an intention that someone spends five to seven hours per week wor working on the project and students are paid uh, stipends that are uh, uh, at least above minimum wage for their time spent on, on these projects. So that's one new initiative that we launched, but we're also doing other initiatives like a, a retail worker reskilling program where we're supporting uh, displaced retail workers to upskill into uh, the Canadian uh, technology sector and uh, lots of new things. I, there's other programs that, that we're considering, but really our vision of an organization is longer term. Uh, you know, how do we potentially serve over like 10,000 young Canadians a year and do it through many different programs. So we started just with this fellowship program where we recruit, train and support recent grads to go work at high growth tech companies. And we now run a half a dozen different programs. I think the future of Venture for Canada is running maybe like a dozen different programs at once, all based on this sort of theme of getting young people to work at startups and small businesses across the country to develop those kinds of entrepreneurial skills. So the fellowship program is one conduit of which we achieve that mission, but there's a lot of other ways I think that we can potentially do it. And, and some of the recent programs we launched are indicative of, I think, the direction of the, the way the organization is going. Very cool. I'm so excited to keep watching what you're doing and to, to potentially get involved. So likewise, Marsha, uh, I'm a big fan of what you do at Fuck Up Nights Toronto. What initially motivated you to launch uh, the organization? Yeah, very good question. I think I, I have sort of a similar answer to you. I, I was also inspired by seeing it somewhere else. So Fuck Up Nights is actually a global speaker series, global community. It originally started in Mexico City, very organically when there was a group of five entrepreneurs kind of sitting around the table drinking some mezcal. And one of them just, uh, she was experiencing a failure with her business. And for the first time ever, she opened up about it and, and shared what was happening with her friends. And she was absolutely shocked that, you know, these successful entrepreneurs around the table all related and they all had battle scars and their own failure stories to share. It was something, it was almost like a taboo topic, like people weren't really talking about it before. You know, in this age of social media, um, everybody's sort of sharing the highlight reel and the successes. So it, you know, it got sparked by that conversation. They came up with the idea um, and they decided to try to do it with a bigger um, group of entrepreneurs. So it kind of started as like an underground thing in Mexico City in a bar. They were bringing people together, getting people on stage, sharing these stories. And it just started growing from there. People from other cities um, were traveling through. They, they came across this community and, and wanted to see how they could bring it to their own city. So that's how I came across it. I, I spent the year um, living abroad and working abroad in Tel Aviv and was going out to a lot of different events and, and Fuck Up Nights uh, was, was one of those that popped up on my Facebook news feed and I just had to go check it out. Like the name caught my attention, um, but the meaning behind it and what this community was all about uh, was what really interested me. 
And yeah, I went to this event and I was blown away. Like I, I would go to so many different things in the tech ecosystem um, in Toronto, but also while living in Tel Aviv. And it was, you know, they all kind of started to feel the same after a while, people sharing uh, their highlight reel and, you know, how they scale their company, you know, all the PR coverage that they were getting, all the really um, nice and fun things of a business. But at this event, super successful people got on stage and, you know, they shared their darkest moments in, in business and what they learned from them and how they moved forward. Um, so it, it really stood out to me from a storytelling perspective. Um, but also it was it felt really unique from other events and that it actually felt like a community. I felt like after hearing those talks that the walls kind of came down for everybody in the audience and everybody kind of you know, just it felt more open with the networking piece of it. it. It didn't feel as superficial as some other events that I've been to. So yeah, fast forward a few months, I came back to Toronto, um, was kind of feeling like a failure myself. And in, in a few ways, I wasn't really sure what my next step was going to be career wise. Um, and I remembered this community and I decided why not try to launch it here? Like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I'm going to fuck up at running fuck up nights. So yeah, I did the first event and it was something that just, it really resonated here and really took off. What is uh, one uh, presentation that has been made at, at Fuck Up Nights at Toronto that uh, is particularly memorable and, and sticks with you? And, and why does it uh, particularly stick with you? Oh, there's, there's so many. I feel like, you know, I have a few um, stories that, that really stand out to me. And I feel like the ones where um, the speaker kind of shares the, the personal side of what was going on while they were experiencing their business failure, because it's, it's so intertwined, right? Like if, if your business is failing, you might be dealing with, um, with, with something on the on the mental health side as well or maybe in your personal life it's really tough to balance it so i've had a few speakers that kind of gave us a look at that um one that jumps to mind is vivian k um absolutely love her story um she's a seven figure shopify plus um a merchant who who started from from really like no entrepreneurial background um but she just had such a such a great story on the, on the business side of, of the failures that she experienced but really opened up on on the personal side as well and she has such a great triumph story of how she got through her failure and then where she is now it's is just so incredibly inspiring out of interest you mentioned that you lived in tel aviv uh for a year and you attended fuck up nights at the tel aviv uh, version do you think that Canadian culture isn't accepting uh, of a failure in comparison to, to other countries like Israel? Yeah, really interesting question. I think, you know, with, with Canada, we're, I, I, I find that we're pretty conservative when it comes to failure. We're really nervous to to admit it, at least like in a, in a really public setting. We, we want to really focus on on the successes and, you know, and, and overall, I feel like Canadians are just like pretty humble, even when it comes to success or sharing failure. Um, so yeah, I think in, in Tel Aviv, it's it's much more ingrained in the culture, um, similar to like Silicon Valley. It's almost like a badge of honor. If, if you've had a failed startup, you know, it, it just means that you you tried something and you, you definitely learned from it. And a lot of investors even look for that because they, you know, they want you to have failed with something before and, you know, instead of with the new thing that you're building with their money. So I think it's just more common there. I think, you know, it's, it's more of an established um, startup ecosystem. So I think it's just something that people talk about more, but it's it's really interesting how failure is perceived in, in different parts of the world. And there was actually an NPR interview about this with multiple chapters of Fuck Up Nights that we can link to um, that kind of explores that, you know, what it, what it looks like across like Canada, US, a place like uh, Tel Aviv, San Francisco, and it's, uh, it's really unique. Um, but I think, yeah, Canada, especially before Fuck Up Nights um, started, I think Fuck Up Nights has, has really made a difference and it made failure a little bit more cool and, you know, something that people share. But that first event, it, it was tough to, to get speakers to even, like, come forward and to share their failures in that way. And then after we had that first event, that I started getting really regular emails from people who, who wanted to share their failure and who kind of saw the value of it. So I think we're making progress. During the pandemic, the rates of entrepreneurship being, has, has surged actually in Canada and the United States. Way more people launching businesses than, than ever before. Why do you think uh, that this is? 
I think it's it, it almost gives people a sense of control uh, at a time when everything is so unpredictable. You know, starting a business, you can you can really take like a challenge that you want solved into your own hands and to to bring something to life and to use the skills that um, that that you really like to develop um, and to build a team around you and to really create something that you think really needs to exist. Um, but yeah, I think it's it really it goes back to like having that sense of control and in, in really unpredictable times and to be able to really solve a challenge that's out there. Agreed. I think that. We live in such uncertain uh, topsy-turvy times where sometimes it feels like we have no control over what's going on, which, uh, you know, as psychologists say, uh, lack of feeling of control is, is a huge driver of anxiety, which is, I think, probably why many people's anxiety is, is a lot higher yeah. than it normally is. So kind of in that vein is, why do you think, in general, more young people should consider entrepreneurship as a career path? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the generation that's that's growing up right now and you know considering entrepreneurship there there's such a unique generation and there's so many unique challenges that the world is facing right now we we need more entrepreneurs and we need people to solve these problems i think again it's you know it's it's a way to kind of take really unpredictable um and and really strange times honestly and to to really do something with it and to to do something good during this time and to take control of your future and 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 bring something to life and into the world that's really going to help solve some of those biggest challenges um and also like you know aside from that it's 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 fun and i think it's it's more accessible than ever you know with with the amazing tech that's out there things like like shopify you know being able to to get funding from from things like clearco um that we talked about earlier it's you know it's never been more accessible and there's never been a better time for it and i think you know young people just being how like savvy they are and how in tune they are with with each other and with the challenges that are happening in the world and how outspoken they are um i think there's there's no one that's better suited and there's no better time than right now the walls uh, that often existed in the past that, that prevented people from pursuing entrepreneurship are in many ways going down and uh, there's more opportunities to be an entrepreneur than, than ever before. That being said, I think also, while it's more accessible, I think it's also in some ways in certain fields, extremely hard to be successful. Uh, so not to, to paint it over optimistically, what I mean by that is that there's like low barrier to entry fields like e-commerce or uh, yeah, re being a real estate agent, for instance, where uh, it's pretty easy to enter into those fields. But then once you're in it, it's actually, I think we all see these success stories of, Oh, I built a Shopify store that says fifty million dollars a year in revenue, but then for everyone like that, there's a thousand. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that just shut down within a, within a month or or don't really go anywhere. But I agree. I think that we we live in a world where it is essential to be entrepreneurial, and that if you're not entrepreneurial, uh, it's really hard to create impact, especially given the amount of uncertainty and the the significant uh, uh, changes that we're facing as as a society. So. Uh, it's so important for, for young people to consider entrepreneurial career paths. Yeah, absolutely. That's it for this week's episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our social and our email list. Subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, tweet us at venture for canada that is Venture, the number four, Canada, or email us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Sturt, and until next time, stay safe, stay motivated, and stay grateful. A New Wave of Entrepreneurship is produced by Winita Lee Garcia and Latifa Farah. Editing and mixing also done by Latifa Farah. Erica Ormanston is our editorial assistant. Mark Wallach and Premium Beat own the copyright and publishing rights related to the song used in this podcast. The comments and opinions, recommendations, or suggestions expressed on the podcast by the guests are not liable to Venture for Canada and belong solely to each individual. Any information provided stated by our guests and our host is independent of Venture for Canada. A new wave of entrepreneurship is a Venture for Canada brand, and all content is owned by Venture for Canada. If you'd like to use our content, 
please reach out to us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca.